Yep, it's live now. All right, assalamu alaikum. Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome. You are currently tuning into the Great National Discourse. We are a student-led initiative aiming at diving headfirst into the issues that matter to us. My name is Hilmi, and I'll be moderating today's episode. Together with me is Brendan Lowe as my co-moderator. So, Brendan. Hi, everyone. Brendan Lau here. Nice to meet all of you and hope you're having a good evening. All right. So in the, last, in the last episode, we looked at the problems and solutions surrounding our education system by bringing in some of the brightest minds in the field. So if you missed that, I highly recommend checking it out. So tonight will be episode two of the series and we'll be discussing a crucial question we ask ourselves as a youth and even if we call ourselves as a belier, will we ever land a job? So to answer this question, we have two highly qualified and experienced guests with us tonight. First, we have Ms. Thur uh, Ms. Noor Thuraya Sazali, a researcher from the Khazana Research Institute. Her work and projects re heavily revolve around the labor force. Secondly, we have Mr. Magat Fazro Azlin, who is the manager, and this is a mouthful, strategic and project management office, industry partnership, graduate and emerging talent at Talent Corp. So we have someone who researches about the labor force and we have someone who works at an agency whose sole purpose is to turn Malaysia into a talent hub, I guess we're in good hands. Ladies and gentlemen, in the COVID-19 era, and as a youth, hopefully graduating soon, I'm always wondering the question, if, I, if the job market is ready for me, or if I am ready for the job market, would there be enough, not just jobs, but would there be enough equitable jobs that promises me a dignified quality of life? Should I seek opportunity here, or with the promise of a better life be in another country. In uncertain times like this, would we see the light at the end of the tunnel? Are we even in a tunnel with an exit at the end? Or are we buried six feet deep and the only way out is to dig ourselves up? So enough with the existential intro and let's move on to getting to know the guests before we dive into the good stuff. So this question goes to Magat Fazrul. What led you to be interested in the area of careers and what and how did that lead you to Talent Corp? Um, Assalamu alaikum. Very good evening, everyone. Uh, Suraya uh, and uh, everyone here today. I uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for actually spending your Saturday night fever with us. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, really fulfilling for me. Um, I think uh, just to uh, give some uh, short background of mine, uh, Magat Fazrul Azlin currently um, uh, in a portfolio of industry uh, partnership as well as graduate and emerging talent. I think as, as what I mentioned by Hilmi just now, um, currently working at uh, Talent Corporation Malaysia Berhad. We are actually a government agency to look into how best actually we can assist or support the country to transform into high income nation. Um, yes, actually it's, um, we are, uh, slowly but surely getting there. Um, and um, I think our work revolves around uh, graduate and emerging talent on how actually we can further assist supporting the, the graduate employability agenda, working closely with the Ministry of Higher Education. And, and on the industry partnership part, we consistently try to expand our industry networks because um, we need to know and understand the demand so that we can assist and support our uh, talent better. Uh, and how on earth am I with Talent Corp? It just, I don't know. So uh, I think that's, that's the reason why. So because your background might not determine where you're going to land your job. And, and, it's, and I'm here today with Talent Corp. With a uh, um, business economic background, I'm with uh, Ministry of uh, finance for three years, then um, not being transferred, but I was actually um, uh, attracted to what, uh, what is actually Talent Corp is doing. I think that's the big question that I'm trying to solve myself. So uh, I got in. So now actually um, uh, covering both uh, portfolios. Yep, enough said. All right, Mr. Morgan, I hope even though you wouldn't wonder how do you get into Talent Corp, I hope the experience will be amazing for us. 
um, to share and listen to. So moving on to Ms. Uh, Suraya, how did you decide to focus your research into the labor force and what was the most interesting discovery in your time as a researcher? Um, hi, everybody. Um, Salam alaikum and thank you very much for having me here. Um, it's, it's, real, it's, it's, it's a real honor. Um, so how I decided to research on labor markets it's by chance, but as a Muslim, like nothing happens by accident. Um, because I still remember like this one course, labor economics, when I was in undergrad, and that actually altered my mind. Um, on you know, like the four or twelve to uh twelve to sixteen years that you spend in education, building up your quote unquote human capital, it's not exactly the correct way, but you know, making yourself ready for for the labor force, and you spend about thirty five to forty years working, <laughs> preparing yourself for the retirement. So um, it's, it was really fascinating. After I graduated, um, I joined Teach for Malaysia and it was actually inspired by the same course. I, <laughs> um, because I, it, it was very clear to me that there's a age, um, no, age gap between when you have qualifications and when you don't have qualifications. And I was sent in a rural area, rural area um, Slamu Bera. I've never heard of Slamu Bera before. I'm a Sremban girl, um, still from a small town, but still have never heard of Slamu. Went there and then realized, oh my God, it's so, so difficult. I actually increased my respect um, for teachers. Um, like, I will send my kids to public school. That's for sure. I know that I need to be in that space. And then I went to do my master's and then I'm back in um, KRI and my, my first project um, actually involved school to a transition survey. And then, yeah, and then here I am and one, one work after another and it, it involved this labor market. And I think we'll talk about later and how important it is, not just on how you see yourself, but also as a major source of your income. Um, there you go. So nothing will happen by chance. It's serendipity, but I... <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, on the the most interesting discovery that I've done throughout my very limited years in research, um, I wouldn't want to pick on specific findings from specific research because later my teammates will be like, why don't you mention um, our project? Why don't you mention our, our specific publications? But I think what I have realized is that um, we rely on figures, on statistics to make a point, um, but we also need to understand that all the figures that we quote, um, all the findings, all the estimates are just that estimates, they, are, they come with limitations. And then um, there's two issues that arise from this. Like number one, um, most people will say that, oh, I don't believe in the figures. <laughs> I don't believe it. Like, there must be like, you know, something biased or, you know, it's a survey, it's, you know, it doesn't capture this. Um, the definition is not it's not wide enough, it's not rigorous enough. Um, if they provide um, constructive feedbacks, yes, we can improve uh, the, the statistics or the way that we measure things. But some people, they just wouldn't want to like, they, they would discredit the figures. Um, so it, it makes it hard. Um, like when people say numbers don't lie, um, and then when people say that, oh, you can just quote this figure, you can change people's mind, it's actually very, very difficult to um, build consensus. Um, and number two, all these figures, all these measurements actually drive policy. So how you, you know, poverty line, um, how you put the poverty lines actually impact who's going to receive, you know, some of the social assistance. So it, it's, it's, it has been both um, life-changing and also challenging to be in this area. Okay, thank you, Ms. Raya, for um, sharing that. Um, we'll talk a bit more about numbers and statistics and how we interpret them um, as we move on. Okay, um, so we've gotten a bit of background from both of the speakers. Now let's dive straight into the good stuff, as I mentioned before. So we'll look at the challenges of status quo. So this question goes to both speakers. Maybe Ms. Raya can, talk, um, can answer first, and then we can move on with uh, Mr. Magat. In your view, what does social mobility mean? What does it entail? And how does employment and our ability to get employed affect that? So, Ms. Raya? Oh, there you go, social mobility. <laughs> well, people throw that around all the time. I think like there's two definitions. One definition is quite funny. It's actually, you, they compare you with your families. 
So are you better off than your families, right? Or better off than your parents? But the problem is the data for that is hard to come by. Um, uh, KRI has actually tried to do it um, in the social mobility study in 2016. Um, we found that yes, um, you know, the, 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 the people who they surveyed actually are much better off than um, their parents in terms of education outcome and income, you know. Um, and then the second one, I think that what matters most for, you know, regular people, including me, is like, are we able to climb the social ladder? Social ladder, what I mean by this is like, you know, can I get, you know, certain income? You know, can I um, get my own property? Can I afford uh, a certain, you know, can I afford certain basic education for my children, right? Um, stuff like that. So, yes. Do you have a follow-up question? <laughs> Yeah, um, so we can, so that was actually interesting, um, the first definition, um, how, how better off are you in comparison to your family? I guess that um, plays a part in, I guess, this is just me um, pitching in an opinion, plays a part in, for example, um, families who are immigrants, um, second generation families, whether or not the second generation is better off than the first and the Malaysian or American dream kind of uh, revolves around that. Okay, um, maybe Mr. Magat? Um, what do you think social mobility entails and especially you working at creating talent and employment, how does employment affect social mobility? Yeah, I think I, I can agree with, with what, what Shraya mentioned just now. Yes, actually, um, people, I think being a, a, a natural human being, uh, you cannot actually deny yourself being compared to each other. So your siblings, your friends and, and, and your, even your colleagues. Even your close siblings, you see, you keep comparing that um, I can do better or she's better, I'm better. I think uh, that that pretty much influence on the uh, where do you want to go or what you want to decide on yourself in the future. Because um, I think not, I'm not, I'm not uh, about to touch uh, social strata because it's more complicated than social mobility. So we just actually look at the at the, um, um, I think, uh, close to us, like comparing ourselves to others, we keep actually competing without realizing that you are actually off tangent, you are actually off track, and you are actually um, um, off track from your real passion. So because actually you want to uh, look better than others. So um, yeah, when, when it comes to social strata, yes, I think also Shraya actually touched touch a bit about, so your family background might might, might, might influence your future too. So if you actually have a good background, then, then you, your path might be uh, greener than others. If you actually uh, coming back from a uh, um, um, family that, that struggling or, or um, um, especially broken family, so they, they might face their own challenges in terms of finding themselves and also how actually they can maneuver themselves in, uh, in, in this kind of challenging era. Yep. Okay, thank you for that. So this is sort of like a follow-up from um, just defining social mobility, right? So what is the current position in Malaysia, be it in government bodies, agencies, NGOs, or even corporations, with regards to the social mobility of the youth specifically? Um, is it a priority for them to create policies that has a you know exit plan at the end? Or is it an afterthought? Um, Ms. Raya, could you answer? Um, I don't think that I'm in any position to speak on behalf of the government or the NGO or the institutions, but I can share what I observe. Um, I feel that if, we, if we're talking about social mobility for youth, um, you have two main champions. One is Ministry of Youth and Sports, and then another one is Ministry of Higher Education. And then that's also contingent on how you define youth. 15 to 24, 15 to 30, you want to look at, you know, like the act, the um, Youth Social Associations Act, is it, 15, I think they have changed in 18, uh, 15 to um, 30, it used to be 15 to 40, but I guess um, those two ministries are the two main champions, because for Ministry of Human Resources, they, they cover a wide range of, you know, populations. Um, right now, the audience is definitely, this is IIUM, and then I'm talking to, I, I, I think, um, uh, younger generations. But I feel that, like, when COVID happened, we know that 
youth will be most affected because they are first time job seekers. Um, first in, uh, uh, last in, first out. We know that women will be most affected. Um, B40, uh, those who cannot um, work at home, who, who cannot telework, so they, they need you know um, to be outside. Um, but because of the MCO, they wouldn't be able to work. So it's covered a wide range of people, including disabled um, or less, less able individuals. So the, the tensions, um, like the competition is really, really, really stiff. Um, everybody is like saying that, you know, we need more money here, we need more money there. I have like a good news and also bad news. Um, to me, good news is um, definitely youth, uh, however you define it, is on the radar. It's not under the radar. Um, it's like the one of okay, the immediate, immediate attention. Um, and also because we know from, you know, study from abroad in, in developed countries, when recession happened, those who graduate during that time, um, they estimated it about to have 10 years um, of earnings reductions. Um, and then, you know, OECD has called <laughs> um, those who graduate uh, during, you know, 2020, 2021 as Corona class. Uh, I, I don't want to be, I don't think that it's actually, okay, never mind. Um, but we know that there's current effect. Whether or not that's uh, um, that's top of the the importance of list, uh, the list of importance, um, I I do not know because to me the the sentiment has been safe life, safe livelihoods, and also the fact that the median age of Malaysia right now is about thirty one. When when we first reach independence, it's about eighteen, eighteen or sixteen. I can remember eighteen. So. <laughs> it's it's really hard because like that's a budget, and everybody wants a, a slice of it. Um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, um, I'm not I'm not too sure. Um, because you know each party will say that. Look at my my um my area of interest. Uh, these are the, the individuals or the groups that advertise. Look at them, give priority to them. So the government has to you know balance balance between these groups. And it's a it's a great responsibility that um yeah. I think I think to, to just add to Soraya's point just now, I think the, the effort is there. I think I, I, I and to be fair, the, the, the effort is there, but it go, it should go hand in hand. So as much as government want to do or as much as the youth want uh um uh want to be developed or, or, or need to be developed so um so when uh, and when i say it goes hand in hand actually like uh it should support each other or complement each other so um when the government actually like launch something or so it need a proactiveness uh, effort from the youth too or else actually it's it's going nowhere so i think the effort is there when when, when Traya actually talking about Especially looking at this current point of time, there's still um, a thing about how actually they can. I think un un unemployment issues go is, uh, is still an, an a hot issue, right? So, but the budget allocation is this, but you need actually to prioritize it. Now, the the the, the main priority is actually like um, uh, um how actually we can do away with with COVID, but government is it's not it's not like abai can everything so it's just like um putting what comes first lah, for at, at that at this current point of time can i just quickly add um uh i think like some um every economists internationally they often cited two main policy measurements to combat to combat um uh you know this uh, this current effects for for youth like number one is government to spend more uh, in terms of which subsidies and then they have done that um like but as i mentioned the the target group is quite wide um you know under 40 they have certain specific programs but because the budget is like that is everything is stretched thin yeah um yeah but uh which subsidies or hiring incentive and the second one is actually interestingly as to um, again, uh, employment mobility or job mobility among the young ones. And I think what they are referring to is like, okay, you get first job, but don't stay too long. 
move yeah. to the next firms that will actually could hire you. So that's what they mean. And then they say that there might be, you know, um, facility that we can provide as job matching or whatnot. But I feel that that's also reminders to everybody out there. Um, if you get your fit into one firm, um, then, then try to think ahead. I mean, like give it your heart, you give it your all to your firm, but if it's a small firm, maybe perhaps I aim for the medium firm and then the large firm and et cetera, so that you can, um, and then they say that the easiest way to increase your wage is to, to move jobs. Okay, thank you so much um, for that. It's a bit, um, a lot of information to process. Um, specifically on the jumping jobs, don't stay too long. Um, I, I will have a, we have a bit more of that um, discussion later on when we talk about how do we progress um, as a youth in our careers? Um, I'll pass it. I'll pass the floor to Brandon now. Yeah, hi, Taraya and Megat. Um, yeah, I just would like to, uh, since we're on the topic of social mobility, maybe let me sort of bring in another metric that is poverty and let's see both of your views on that. So um, based on the household income estimates and incidents of poverty report Malaysia 2020, and here are the numbers for you, Taraya. Uh, but, and this is published by the Department of Statistics Malaysia, 20% of M40 group has moved to the B40 group and 12.8% of the T20 group has moved to the M40 group. So there is a do double downward movement. And in absolute terms, the number of poor households increased to 639.8 thousand households in 2020 as compared to 405.4 thousand households in 2019. So the question is, do you think that youth employment can work towards solving this poverty problem? And if so, to what extent? Maybe, um, so yeah. Ms. Raya, you could go first. Okay, um, I'll answer your last questions quickly. Um, the answer is yes, because like if you look at the source of income, of household income, household income is not you. It's you plus you know your spouse and your children, or, or if you leave your parents, that's a household, that's a rumah. Right. Um, four main sources of income. Five, I think. Okay. First is paid employment, self employment, um, property, investment, and then the last one is transfer. Transfer any you know cash transfer from government lah. Properties you cannot eat your house, <laughs> so we often forget that. But by and large, well, almost sixty percent of your household income come from paid employment. So I feel that you know among us, the colleagues will say that. Some will say that you know we need to encourage women to work because if you encourage your wife to work, you double the income. <laughs> or um, so that's the thinking. So I guess in a in a very superficial way, yes. Um, but also I want to touch a bit on household. I'm not exactly a household expert. There are more qualified people um, in Kerala that will be able to speak on that. But the T20, B40, middle top 20, middle 40, bottom 40, those are just demarcation so if we are in recession if we are booming they will always be b40 because it's just you know like 100 percent uh 20 40 40 so but i think like without getting too much detail what the DOS is saying is <laughs> time is bad um because we see in the household income has actually dropped um average salary mean salary whichever indicator that you look it has actually dropped um so i feel that Retaining jobs and generating more jobs, definitely, definitely in number one, top one agenda um, right now. It's just like how the detail, the nitty gritty, um, you know, have to be worked out. I see. Thanks, Raya. And maybe Mega, would you like to share your opinions on that as well? Yeah, I think if you actually look at the current situation, this is where all the the, the, the gap is actually is, is getting bigger. So because we are actually facing the pandemic, we are facing actually the, the, the challenge of actually people are losing jobs, that kind of thing. I think that's, that's the, 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 the reason why. I think the, the problem is always going to be that. So we are actually struggling with the, the living costs, especially in the city. We are, especially, uh, you can't compare yourself actually living in Pantan versus living in KL. So they are actually quite vast difference in terms of actually your living cost, that kind of thing. But I think, uh, and, and, and when the pandemic hit us, it worsened the, 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 the current scale. The economy actually is not, not, not to say paralyzed, but slow the pace. 
the, uh, the pace is slower compared to what we expect to be. I think that's um, with or without pandemic, the gap will be there. So it's just that when, when something hit us and it affects the, 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 the household. So uh, like, like Traya said, household means that I, my wife, actually earn income. So if, if the, the, the pandemic effect actually like might affect us in terms of, or oh, my wife actually um, uh, lose her job. So then straight away, I, I, I fall into other category. Just because I think that the problem is going to be that uh, with or without pandemic, but um, with uh, and how actually we can further expand our economy, creating new jobs, uh, creating more uh, high value jobs that, that, that will lead to at least cushioning the gap. So we are not, we, we are not trying to, to make the gap bigger, but try um, slowly but surely cushioning the gap moving forward. Thanks, Vega. And it's very helpful for you to point out how the pandemic actually sort of just worsens the gaps that are already there. I think it's a common theme across most economic analysis. Also, you mentioned a point about um, movement of youth from other states, which interestingly enough is a question that we'll get to later for the members of the audience who are interested. Um, I guess maybe now a, a second question, and I guess um, to both speakers as well. We meant we mentioned the metric of poverty here, and also the sub-metrics of the B40, M20, and T, M40 and T20. And I was just one, and Raya, you mentioned that sub-metrics like that um, may not actually be the most effective. So what then are you think, the, do, you, do both of you think are the metrics that are useful that we can look at that help us track whether our economy is moving back to its pre-COVID um, levels, or maybe even better than its pre-COVID levels? Um, I guess I'll have to go first. <laughs> um, you know, like people who are more qualified, qualified than me would actually, you know, would have, you know, amazing time describing the 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 pitfall of each indicator that we use, be it gross domestic, domestic products, give it unemployment, etc. But I feel that if I have to answer this, we cannot just rely on one. Um, even tracking um this the status of our health. It has to be a range of things. And then I feel that most importantly for, for the policymakers, they have to be aware of limitation and what it means for certain figures. So we should not be overconfident, over-reliance on certain figures and over another. It will always be, you know, I wouldn't say that. I think like you, you need a desktop, you know, full of uh, figures that you Data can set. contrast. Yeah. So that you you say that okay um, here's a limitation of this and therefore to give example for example unemployment rate right not too bad five percent four point three four point eight and whatnot but we also have the the issues of uh, you know skill underemployment or people you know doing jobs that they are overqualified for and we also have time related underemployment so we need these figures to you know so that we can compare so we are not to you know too optimistic, too pessimistic, and it always come in a package. Yeah, yeah. I think I think to, to also add to the point just now, it's it needs a range of data sets. So you are talking about um um now actually uh, people are underemployed, people are doing gig jobs, which data that we um, um find it hard to capture. So um you need a, a thorough research, thorough data sets in terms of setting the benchmarking. Because I think I think that's the the the, the all reason why actually we just can stick to the minimum wages of thousand two. So it's hard for us actually to do benchmarking, um, uh, even a diploma or or degree. Should should they should we actually put a a a, a standard of if she if she qualified. Um, uh, for a diploma job, what kind of actually salary, a starting salary you should have. I think um, we need a range of, of, of data sets or um, a demographic actually to look into that. Yep. I see. Thanks, Raya and Megat. And, and I guess here, if I may ask a question that may sound rather controversial in light of the topic that we're asking um, and, and might, but hopefully not make some listeners angry, but how valuable is the metric of 
youth employment, youth specifically, in the whole data set. So as you say, we have many different, we have a range of data sets to consider. To what extent should we put emphasis on youth employment? And I know I'm sort of challenging the basis of this, <laughs> this discussion in the first place, but yeah, just to hear your views. I guess like Brandon, I'm sure you see that, oh, if it's 15 to 24, so that you lump it, you know, those who didn't even finish their secondary education with graduates, right? And we also have graduate statistics from department statistics, but then you lump everybody together from 15 to 64, and therefore you get the average. Um, and then you look at the Ministry of Higher Education coming up with the um, graduate trustee studies, but they quote employability rate, and then that includes a range of things from you know getting uh, working, um, studying, going to study, going to work. So I mean, <sighs> indicators are short hands. Um, sometimes we need that figures to like um, to put things on the agenda. Um, Given this current effects, I mean, like, sure, sometimes you need to, you know, to, to get through the message, uh, pay attention to this group, uh, this is data, but we also have to be mindful of, you know, the limitations of what we are seeing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Jiraiya. And I guess I have a brief follow-up for Megat as well. You mentioned the point on... Um, which um, minimum wages, and I think that would also raise a lot of, I will capture a lot of the attention of youth, especially um, maybe in light of things like what um, Shed, the MP Shed Sadiq mentioned about the 900 ringgit wage, or, or just the whole general idea of youth rights to have a fair and equal wage. Like I, I wonder what, I know what, without of course asking you to speak, um, to, to try to put yourself in the government's shoes or anything like that, uh, um, how, how do you think like wage, uh, minimum wage or minimum wages can be improved. Yeah, I think yes, yes. Uh, Brandon, I think um not not in, in position actually to just express it or to just actually uh, uh through uh, anything uh, uh speculative. But I think it should be as easy as actually um on looking at what kind of qualification. I think we we have the minimum wage there. And if you actually um uh, uh get your SKM one two three, you should have actually at least a, a rational range of salary. So uh, or else actually we, we continuously uh, heavily rely, rely on the minimum wage because employers uh, have actually the sole power actually to, to decide what are the salary scale that I should give to my employee. So if you actually ask me and, and, and without actually uh, speculate this further, so I just actually like it should, I think the talent should be paid um, uh, according to their uh, uh, capabilities or their competencies, I think that's 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 the 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 right word that, that if I can I can put it, it should be based on um, um, competency. So if actually if you if if you uh, should earn two thousand, then you should you should actually uh, earn two thousand. But I think the 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 current landscape is varies. So employers are also various, sectors are also various. Actually, they have their own standards on determining this kind of um, uh, uh, question. Uh, and and not, not to say about competing with the uh, cheap labor, foreign labor. So I think that's another <laughs> issue. Uh. Yeah, thanks, Vegat, for that. And, th and that's a very balanced view. Thank, thank you for that. Um, I have I to. guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'll... Pass it back to Hume as we move towards the second theme in our discussion, moving towards the future. So Hume. Yep. Um, thank you so much. Um, but before we move on, there's actually one question that um, has to be asked um, to Magat, specifically because you mentioned like different corporations, different companies, different bosses have different metrics of how they give salaries. So the question is, could you explain to us that thought process in determining salaries and remunerations if we compare ourselves to other countries our salary is not competitive and arguably some people might even argue inequitable how do we work around this issue like what is the thought process behind giving salaries and how do we work around this issue okay i think uh, because like like i mentioned earlier um our industry players are various they are big guns they are big names they are established company who have everything structured and they have actually things in place actually to provide or oh, the minimum salary of 
my employee should be this portion. But how about those startups, SMEs? Actually, because they start small, so the, we are not expect them actually to pay at the same level of the multinational companies. So I think because of the industries are various, and, and like I mentioned earlier, employers actually have the sole power, so-called power actually to, to decide what are the range of salary. I think given the current situation, some people might not just, some people will just, oh, tak apalah. At least I boleh kerja. And, and they are okay with that salary as long as they can survive. I think that's the baseline for, for, for one, one person. But if you're looking at the bigger picture, like I like mentioned earlier, so because uh, we have actually vast um, uh, uh, economic sector, vast industries, industry players, SMEs, startup, which um, some might just start small. So they, they can't afford actually to, to pay a, a salary equivalent to the big, big companies. So while the big companies actually have everything structured ready, so they, they, they are following the global practice, that kind of thing. So they are paying at their standard, but not really, um, uh, we cannot actually compare uh, big MNCs with startup, with uh, SMBs. Actually, they definitely actually have their own Kind of due diligence in terms of how they determine this kind of uh, a salary. Okay, thank you so much um, for that answer. Um, I'll consider that um, when it comes to deciding what kind of jobs or where do I work at. So let's move up, move on to the second theme. The second theme will look at how do we move forward, how moving towards the future, basically. So the first question, and I think this is a very personal question as well is upscaling has always been the go-to suggestion for the youth in order to improve their quality of life, right? You have to upscale, you have to get more skills and everything. So the question is, what would be that pathway? What, what do we upscale first? What are the best resources to do? Are there certain skills that we upscale ourselves, but turns out it's not a skill sought after? But yeah, so Magat, could you answer this? Okay. I think I think even even from the government point of view, actually, um, the government is continuously spending on upskilling, reskilling our talent. So, but if you, if you actually ask me, uh, to be honest, actually, it should start as early as possible. I think try to try to look into upskill yourself because actually, I think the the important point actually for the talent actually to know themselves well, to know themselves well and how they want actually to chart their their career in the future. If let's say Megat want to be engineer at Petronas, I should work my way up actually to secure my job with Petronas to, to understand what kind of actually skills needed by the employers, to, to understand what are the, the skills um, required actually to land my first job. I think it, if, if the government is continuously spending on upskilling and reskilling after graduation, continuously cost, cost the government because actually what we expect for the talent actually to be uh, more empowered so they can actually like um, that's why I say actually the talent need to know themselves chart, chart their own career roadmap on what kind of job I, I think I would land uh, after my graduation and work for it work for it in terms of actually upskill yourself uh, now actually I think the pandemic actually um, um, good lesson of actually there are vast of uh, online courses available online. LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, Udemy, you name it. So you, it can be done digitally or, or, or through online. Um, and you need actually to um, uh, know yourself better, upskill yourself, continuously upgrade yourself so you are not actually go into the unemployment uh, bucket. So with a good preparation of actually uh, know yourself well, upskill yourself actually uh, with the skills required by your potential future employers, I think it, you will land uh, a job faster than others who are expect them to be upskill or reskill after graduation. So by, by if you're looking at skill, the, the crucial skills need to be furnished 
is the essential skill, communication skills. I think, I think it's always about um, uh, communication. I, I think industries are also actually telling that uh, um, it's hard actually to find uh, talent that, that can communicate well, articulate well, have a good critical thinking, have a good actually problem solving method. So um, if you didn't ask me, the, the most crucial skills that you need actually to sharpen, especially for young graduates, is always about uh, um, uh, essential skills, the employability essential skills, such as soft skills, English, communication, uh, articulative thinking, critical thinking, and, and, and problem solving. Okay, um, thank you so much um, for that. Speaking about soft skills and communication, I, I hope I have that in the bag. Um, so... But just a quick um, question, very quick. Coursera's LinkedIn classes, are they recognized by companies? Yep, yep, definitely, definitely. I think it's also actually, that, that's the, that, I think if you look at my point just now, I think that's the, the reason why the talent needs to actually to determine where they're going to be and, and understand what kind of skills or competitive edge required by the company and go seek for that kind of skills. So it can be Coursera, it can be Udemy, it can be LinkedIn Learning. But I think somehow or other, actually employers are uh, kind of actually appreciated now compared to at least five years back. So because five years back is always about conventional, you're attending physical class, that kind of thing. And now with the, with the uh, uh, technology and, and, and uh, landscape change of, how we conserve things um, uh, through digital, I think companies is quite uh, accept, acceptance to that kind of uh, certification or digital badges or micro-credentialing. Yep. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, one last follow-up question with regards to upskilling because the problem is, is that sometimes and most of the time, actually majority of the case, Upskilling requires capital. You need money. You need, the, you need to know where the opportunity lies. Even things like, for example, Coursera, because I've taken a Coursera course, but I can't audit it because I'm not paying it. Therefore, I don't have the certificate to prove yeah. that I actually have done the Coursera um, course. And more often than not, a lot of the times people who are already in privilege or are in positions of privilege are the ones that have the opportunity to upskill themselves gratefully, uh, tremendously. Like the only reason why you can go to a lot of NGOs when you were in um, university and not drive a grab is because your parents give you enough money so that you don't need to think about getting money. That's why you can do all of those upskilling things. So how does the average person do that? Those who are not born with as much privilege, where do they find these opportunities? I think uh, this is actually where the reason why um, the homework needs to be done early. So we have actually HRD Corp that offers actually a range of this kind of upskilling, uh, reskilling uh, courses. So they are supported by the government. They offer um, various kind of uh, trainings, uh, upskilling, reskilling, you name it, across um, uh, uh, sector economics. So uh, just a matter of actually, you need to know where are the sources. So I think there, there's a lot of um, government effort put into officially look at Penjana 1, Penjana 2.0, especially look into on how actually we can upskill and reskill our graduate talent. HRD Corp actually is looked into, I think quite numbers of actually how can we upskill our talent and get them a job. So that actually they fit with the requirements coming from the industries. So um, main thing is actually like you need to know the sources. Siapa yang akan bagi this kind of upskilling training yang supported by the government? Um, also very quickly, um, I'm sure um, most people would know this, but I'm that um, actually partner with Coursera and then they provide free access. So I would encourage everybody to go ahead and, you know, sign up. I'm that. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I actually suggested to the content team to post up a link of free or affordable places where people can upskill. I hope that that would help um, the viewers to at least give themselves a shot at a better quality of life. Yep, so I can pass this to Brendan. Yeah, thanks everyone for that very helpful discussion on like, upskilling and really I myself have learned a lot like hearing about 
they're having some exposure to Coursera, but very minimal. And I guess I'm one of those who are like just recently finding out the great amount of options available for upskilling. Um, yeah, so thanks for that so much. And now switching to a bit of a different theme and one we sort of touched on earlier on um on just on youth mobility in the context of different cities and states. So um this is a point that Mr. Megat mentioned earlier about how um yeah about movement between states and we see how there's um income disparity. For example, the real median monthly in household income in Labuan, Sabah and Sarawak are five eight seven three five eight seven three ringgit in comparison to nine five eight one ringgit in Kuala Lumpur, Putrajaya and Selangor. So what we expect, and I guess you may see even without the statistics, we hear it from our friends and contacts, everyone is moving to KL and and Selangor and, and Putrajaya. And this might seem to be a problem. So is there a way we can work towards fixing this or do we continue uh, to allow this great youth migration to Kuala Lumpur? I mean, I can ask uh, Ms. Duraya first. Um, yeah, um, Brandon, that's right. I mean, like the data speaks for itself. Um, we have Kantan, uh, Sabah and Labuan, I think, so it makes sense. And then those also incomes actually reflects the employment opportunities that they have. Um, the unemployment rate is high, really high. It's, it's heartbreaking almost um, in, in certain states versus the others. Um, well, the government cannot restrain your right to move unless it's COVID. <laughs> so, um, I mean, like, I, I, they cannot tell you like not to go here, not to go there. I think they have done, you know, um, regional corridors where they try to stimulate regional development. I'm actually quite undecided on whether we should just encourage people to move to KL because it depends also on your industry for the, for the finance sector. Where else will you work? I mean, like you can work in small branches and whatnot, right? And then um, in the quote unquote rural areas, um, you can see like the self-employment share is actually much higher than the urban area because there's no job opportunities. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, really conflicted. <laughs> I don't have an answer to that uh, because the cost of living in KL is really high. And then I'm not too sure if like, um, you know, we have this awareness of like, okay, I'm going to graduate in six months. So I have to start, you know, saving up because I know that I wouldn't receive my paycheck immediately. And I also need like three to six months um, to, to find a job and to go to interview and whatnot. So, yeah. I'm 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 really really undecided. <laughs> I don't know how to answer to that. I think I think to 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 add to my point, if you actually when when we speak about mobility, we can't stop people from going anywhere that they feel like the oppos the opp the opportunities is good for them. So I think the the the, the current um, mindset is always about oh Klang Valley is so so I have everything in Klang Valley, but I think. Like 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 what I uh, mentioned earlier. Actually, you need actually to know where you are heading. If I actually uh, am uh, an uh, electrical in, uh, engineering background per se, my job prospect is brighter in the northern side because there, northern side are actually the hub for ENE. So uh, I think that's the we can we can stop people from going here and there they can they can they can they can even go abroad where they find the opportunity actually is good for them so um yep uh, like so i also mentioned that the corridors are also try to stimulate uh, uh the regional areas so that actually more uh investment coming more opportunities can be created from that from, from that um uh, activity but it takes time, definitely take time. Because actually, uh, um, we also, when, when we talk about attracting investment, it's also about what we can offer to our investor. So because everyone actually is like centered towards Klang Valley, so Sabah, Sarawak, uh, Kelantan, Terengganu. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the reason why everyone actually just squeeze to, to be in Klang Valley, where the good names are. I see that that's a very helpful way of putting it, Megat. Uh, yeah, it, I see that I'm I really like how you linked the 
mindset of making sure you know what you want to do with the reputational names and their geographic location and see actually if you know what you want to do, it goes towards solving the problem of everyone moving to KL. Yeah, I, I guess just a follow-up question and for both speakers, do you think it's, um, I, I well, strongly admitting that we cannot restrict the freedom of youth to move around the country, do you think it's sustainable if we allow everyone to move to KL for say the next 20 years? Uh. I, I think it, it back to the question of actually where the opportunities actually uh, um, will lead them to. Um, some might say that, okay lah, tak apalah, I can just actually be at my hometown, try to actually figure out what kind of opportunity here for me. And then that's okay. But if you look at the numbers, if out of 10, just one actually want to look. Just actually, okay lah, lay back, I just, I just stay at my hometown. And the other nine are actually uh, rush into KL. So actually, we, we, can't, we can't stop that in a way, but I think it also depends on how fast we can stimulate others' region, economic area, and, and how much more uh, job opportunities actually can be created by others, by other region will help to actually like, at least people now actually have more not, not everyone actually is just go, going to go to KL, but they now can go to Johor. They now, they now can go to Batukawa and Penang. They now can go to uh, East Coast Corridor. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not work the kind of oil rig. Tapi I tak nak duduk kat Sarawak, I nak duduk kat Cengganu. So I think, uh, yes, it also actually depends on, the talent actually needs to know where, where the opportunities are for them, good opportunities are for them. Kalau Northern, then go Northern. Kalau Johor, then go Johor. So that, because actually everyone will, Definitely competing actually to go to KL. KL can best. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So yeah. I think uh, yeah. yeah. That's about. It. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Zuraya, would you like to add on to that? Um, I mean, like, so we 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 did a survey, and then I think like most people they said that they are willing to, um. Their yeah, movement is quite limited. It's either within states or to you know to go to urban area, not to rural area. And I think it's it's to me the way I see is it's quite practical. Of course, you want to see with your parents, right? Like given the wage, come on, <laughs> I cannot afford it. And then you asking me to travel. Um, and I'm also thinking out loud, like uh, uh, I'm not too sure whether this will be actually a reality in the future. But we have KL. KL, Selangor, and also Johor, like, you know, high population right, levels. Maybe perhaps as we continue to age, then um, the elder, um, the older groups will actually leave to make way for, you know, the, the young ones so that they can grab the, the job opportunities around. Um, but I think like Daniel Rama, I'm sorry for pointing you out, um, he actually shared uh, a link on the EPF, uh, the estimates about 2,800, if I'm not mistaken. That's why it's... Uh, Ban Negara figure, 2,800 singles living in KL, um, then you need about that amount of money to have a decent, <laughs> decent you can, you know, meet your friends and whatnot. So I guess what I'm trying to say is know the cost of living. And um, also, I, I, I believe that people can decide for themselves, actually. And just do you. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks to both speakers for that. And yeah, thanks to both also for pointing out the um yeah the, the other regional opportunities as well and just and it, it's not being a reality that all the job opportunities are in KL. And I and I guess at the end at the end of the day, also a point that Mr. Megat repeatedly makes, which I think is very warranted that he repeatedly makes it, is that we need to know what we want and that will actually help a lot in sort of guiding our direction of where to travel to or which state to move to. Um yeah, now taking a different slant towards our questioning, maybe we can talk, we have a few questions on the youth employment in specific um, industries. So AI is a, is a common catchword, it's one that everyone talks about. And I was wondering, um, maybe um, to any speaker who, who would like to give to weigh in on this, how, how do you, what, a, what potential do you think AI has for youth? And maybe is it the only potential or are we just getting carried away by the buzzword AI? Go 
Okay, do you want to go first? Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, not, not, yeah, it's, it's a vast word actually, like, been put there for global, for the global. I think, but I think the, the, the main question is, are we ready? Is uh, the industries ready? So I think uh, when, when it comes actually like, yes, the pandemic, when, when the pandemic hits us, everything turns digital. So we try to adapt things and, and adapt things uh, virtually, adapt things, actually do things digitally, that kind of thing. Uh, also, like actually, when we, when we look into yes, actually we are heading there, but we are not Japan, we are not Korea, uh, and and whether our industry are ready actually to adopt it, hundred percent, and our is our talent actually is ready to, uh, be in that arena. Yep. Yeah, that's very fair. Thanks, my God, and Zuraya. Um, well, my team colleagues in KRI actually has done estimations on, on the, the share of jobs that can be replaced by technology. Like I'll just start with the caveats that this um, concern of technology replacing humans have been since the first technology um, in revolutions. Um, with the replacements of horse, you use horse, now you use train or steam, steam, steam engines, right? Uh, it's about 60%. What the 60% means is that 60% of jobs in Malaysia can be replaced by a machine because most of the jobs that we have in Malaysia are low skill <laughs> in services. So if you go to McDonald's, you have the machines, right? But of course, this is not too pessimistic because we know that if you allow firms to adopt these machines and then they can get more money and then with more money, they are greedy, they want to hire more people. So we do not know like the, the net effects, but in general, um, they will be winning and losers. But I think like the history will say that, um, you know, on net, there will be more jobs. But what happened to those who lost their jobs, right? Who cannot be skills. Um, and then I, I, I'm quite sympathetic with the youths when, they, when we ask you to reskill, to get more credentials. I bet you guys know more than us when it comes to all the tech stuff. Come on, uh, you know, like I think you were here on, on, on Twitter, like I have to, you know, to teach my boss how to uh, change PDF to Excel, etc, etc. Guess are okay. But for people who are like me, I guess, we cannot catch up, um, then, then there will be losers. And then um, I think that, but then all this depends on policy in a way, what kind of technology do we want to promote? Technology that make working more safe, safer and more productive, or are we just going to say that, ah, oh, whatever, that can save you money. So that kind of strategic thinking, I'm pretty sure at the higher levels, they have it at the back of their mind, but how to translate that? And also like Magad actually say like, the reality is most of the firms 60% oh no, I mean like majority, not 60%, majority of our firms are SMEs anyway, right? At a higher about 60% of employments. Um, so the, the future might not be as bleak, but that doesn't mean that we should not, you know, be oblivious to it. Yes. Thanks, Raya, for that very encouraging note. And and while I, I I thank you for the generosity of the compliments to us, you for being better at technology, I don't think it's very true. Funnily enough, um, in one of the emails from my university when we first moved online, in, in them reflecting on their um, COVID procedures, they mentioned that we thought we underestimated the, that we overestimated the potential of the youth in navigating the digital re realm. And I was like, mm, what, what a subtle way to, to baka kita with, while reflecting on their own. With you guys don't want to join. Ah? Be naughty. Don't want to join. Don't want to participate. <laughs> I strongly disagree. <laughs> no, I think this, this is where we actually we, we talk about generation gap. Right? I think while the, actually the youngsters are actually in a way quickly adopted. So we, because, because we can be considered actually we are exposed to that. But, but maybe our bosses because actually they used to actually the conventional way of doing things. So give and take. Lah. So you know things, you aja. I think there's no wrong with that. Yeah, yeah that's, 
that, yeah, thanks, Mr. Megat, for that <laughs> for that generosity. Uh, um, I guess now shifting to another industry that also has some interest is the arts, and I think by arts here it means people, um, like including fine arts, stretching all the way there. So, what do you think is the potential of the arts in Malaysia in in light of um youth employment? Yeah, so IE youth employment in the arts. Um, to Raya, you go go first. Right. So I think <laughs> because I'll, I'll go back to the, the Ministry of Higher Education's classifications of arts and that includes, you know, fine arts, drawing, um, audio, creative, visuals, and also languages, history, and philosophy. Um, if I look at the Ministry of Higher Education's graduate research studies, the employability is low. Wait, hold on. Um, it's the second last. The, the, the last a uh, field of study that has the lowest employability is agriculture and um, vet veterinary. But the difference is not much. The range is about like 86% to 81%. So I mean like, so for arts, it's about like 82%. So eight out of 10, um, you know, will be employed. But what kind of jobs? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. Uh, and then I feel that, Okay, I don't have, I, I'm speculating at this moment, but I feel like the skills that you pick up um, can also be very valuable if you ex try to sell it on, um, in the international markets, especially if you arts, right? And then if you can, you know, do digital copies and now you can be, you know, a digital worker platform and then sell it, YouTube. If you're very languages, you can be, you know, in PR, all the PDF that need to go out, <laughs> need to back, to be back through a human <laughs> cannot always rely on you know um the, the softwares that we have so um those are the opportunities i i do recognize that you know for example museums right like our tax base is not as high as developed countries where they can buy you know and then they can maintain the museum and whatnot but yeah i'm i'm quite hopeful um it can be done, inshallah. Um, I just don't feel that I, I don't want you guys to live with like low self-confidence. <laughs> I want to, you guys to like, you know, put yourself at the back. You know, I have this, this degree. This degree is expensive, you know, for me to get to IIUM, uh, for you, Brandon, to get to Cambridge is really difficult. Sell yourself. It's okay. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, and I think I'm just imagining what's going on, Mr. Megat's head. Imagine someone goes goes to you, Mr. Megat, and say, "Can I, I want to be a historian?" But the employment prospects are so low, and our museums are not the not like a, the best place to work at. I don't know how how would you respond to that? And if if I if I can add to Asraya's point, yes, actually, like um, if you actually look at five years back, actually when we actually uh, train uh biotech students without actually uh, um, uh, understand the real ecosystem is not that systematic or, or working in Malaysia. So I think um, that's one lesson, big lesson actually to learn. But also actually um, arts is there. But um, you have, I think from the talent point of view, actually you have actually two options within you. Things that you can control is actually um, Yes, actually, back to the question, actually, you need to know yourself where you want to go. So, if actually, memang dai-dai nak, nak buat art, memang dai-dai nak jadi artis, fine art artis, then Malaysia might not be suitable for you. So, you can do remote working. You can actually work from maybe just from by the beach, but working with US company that managing all these kind of art things. But if you actually uh, think that the second option is actually like to upgrade yourself or to upskill yourself, actually where you can, where the additional skills can complement and put you into maybe other industries that can benefit you. So I think that's, that's my take from, from this. And can I also share, I mean, like this is anecdotal. I, I don't have the figures for this, but... Um... Uh, I know that the Final Fantasy team in Japan, like one of it from Malaysia, um, and also um, I also have a friend who do fine arts but digital, and then her artwork is um, 
it's actually featured in Netflix on, on Netflix. So, but she she served an international market. Yeah. I wouldn't call a friend lah, an acquaintance. Tak kawan pula kan. But yeah, so those are the opportunities that um that that will be made available, and then a lot of um news agency or media agency requires you know some infographics and whatnot. So look up for that lah. Yeah, I think pure pure fine arts can complement digital media. You never know, and actually you can you can secure yourself actually by working with media agency, PR agency, that kind of things. I think and and how actually you. So that's why I say actually you have two options. Kalau you memang die die nak buat fine arts, nak jadi artist, so you work for it. So if if the Malaysian landscape is is not fit for you, you might want actually to explore other opportunities out there. But if it, if you actually feels like I want to be in Malaysia, so I need to actually to maybe upgrade myself actually. What are the skills can be complemented together, or can be blend together? Then actually, I can explore maybe other, other sector or other, other uh, businesses. All right. Thank, thanks so much for that, that comprehensive provision of information, Traya and Megat. Uh, just like to pass it now to Hilmi for to continue the team. All right. Um, thanks so much, Brendan. Okay. Um, I just want to capture um if. Like a sentence that Mr. Magat said, which is that if you feel like opportunities don't exist in Malaysia, you may opt out and look for opportunities elsewhere. This falls sort of like nicely with the next theme of discussion that I want to bring up, which is reading into the general narratives amongst the youth. The youth suggests that opportunities in Malaysia are either very limited or are not meaningful enough for them. As a result, there has been a pretty obvious brain drain problem. So a lot of our high, you know, like high performing talents, um, choosing to work elsewhere. But more importantly, and this is sort of like um, coming anecdotally from observing some people, the high performing talents are also like the big people who have been given those big prestigious scholarships, you know, and then they break their bond and start working outside, because apparently Malaysia is not such a good place of opportunity. So this question has there's two folds to this question. The first is, do you think brain drain is a pro real problem in Malaysia, and how do we solve this? But second, second is, if I notice the trend is that those who are being given these very prestigious scholarships and can afford to break their bonds are the ones that, you know, um, would decide not to work back in Malaysia. Should we give scholarships based on necessity and need as opposed to pure merit? Um, Mr. Magat first, and then we can um, okay. go for Mrs. Raya. When we actually talk about brain drain, it's a global phenomenon. So I think, you know, Singapore actually tapping talent from uh, countries across the world. Australia actually welcome people actually to come, come to Australia, be Australians. So uh, I think it's happened across the globe, uh, uh, brain drain. And, and also, actually, in, in relation to my point uh, my earlier, the talent actually will go where the opportunity benefit them the most. So some might go after salary. Some might go after passions. Some might go after... Uh, some, some might think, oh, actually, I just want to stay with my family to look, up, to look, to look out for them. So um, when... I think your question now is whether, uh, whether our our ecosystem or Malaysia actually can provide good opportunities. My uh, question actually to the to to talent out there: Are you actually done confident and done your homework hundred percent, or just actually relying on assumptions that ah Malaysia tak ada lah opportunity for me? I might my opportunity or or myself actually fit the cut. Uh, UK, the kind of Australia. So um, I think to also to to be fair, there are vast of opportunities here in Malaysia across sectors. They are they are good industries. They are thriving industries. Even even during the pandemic, they are still thriving industries. Some companies are still aggressively hiring. So um, whether uh, wh whether actually like um, the talents they have done the the homework. Actually, if you're talking about plastic, 
surgeons ke okay lah Malaysia might not be the the ecosystem lah I might go to Korea because Korea fit me better kan so um um the talent so need to to do the groundworks themselves actually to understand to understand the whole landscape of betul ke tak ada opportunity for me in Malaysia and then go out actually and and when you actually speak about um uh, uh those who are uh breaking the bond so actually if you actually taking a JPA scholars I think the obligation for you actually to come back and serve the nation I think that's that's the 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 um big agenda of actually providing scholarship and actually if you ask me from my personal of view yes actually we should bagi scholarship to those yang actually layak for that for scholarship not just to yeah okay I, I, I actually just stop there Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Mugat. Um, we'll try to find um, sources um, that help people look for jobs. Um, maybe we can post it as well besides the upskilling. Hopefully, like, you know, those high talent, uh, high performing talents don't run away, come back to the nation and help us build this country. Uh, Mr. Raya, do you have um, some thoughts on either brain drain as a problem or um, high performing talents bonded under scholarships? Hey, um, um, excuse my cat, but I, it's a very emotional topic to me at this because I have friends who have um, broken their bond, bond and not come back, but I can see where they're coming from, from their perspective, like we got to see that, you know, opportunities elsewhere, you know, they got, you know, um, hired by the, the top, top um, firms in, in the world. Um, so I'm very conflicted. I'm 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 not too sure. Um, but because obviously for Malaysia, they are losing tax money, lah. Uh, yeah. The talents work here. Um, if you earn, you know, about like three thousand, just three thousand. Um, net, excluding your EPF, then you have to pay income tax, right? And then also, you know, the ability to contribute to the nations. <sighs> I I can see where they're coming from, but at the same time, I, I can't remember, I can't recall exactly the studies, but I remember specifically reading something along the line that um, the expat living abroad, um, the numbers of individuals who give up their citizenship are quite low. So there's a, still attachment to the countries. And then they track this, if I'm not mistaken, by you know how many people who refuse to withdraw EPF completely. I'm not too sure. Lah. But I feel that there's still, if you ask like, some Malaysians abroad are, are even you know, willing to um, come back to vote and whatnot, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and I feel that uh, Megat, there's some programs for uh, within talent corps where they sure. some tax incentive for them after they gain experience and then they come back. And so sometimes this country, right? Unless you achieve something really big abroad, then they wouldn't look at you. So um, I feel that we, if I, you know, like we should always welcome them and also not to victimize or not villainize them too heavily. Yeah. But questions of um, scholarships and whether that should be, okay, the question of merits, tell me, I mean, like, come on now, we can do like one solid <laughs> and then you can invite, you know, more qualified people to talk about it. Um, but, there, but there have been like, you know, people have been voicing out why are kids from high income, high income families are receiving all these, you know, um, heavy checks, uh, scholarships, right? Their results are not necessarily come on, uh, um, ref reflect. I mean, we, we all should be mindful of our privileges. Um, I think that. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I cannot decide on the metrics on how they decide on scholarships and whatnot, uh, but I feel that that's something that um, they have to be um, quite mindful of. Yep. Okay, thank you so much um, for that. I, I guess like that has been sort of like a very strong general narrative with regards to just mining or at least acknowledging one's privilege and not, you know, flaunting it um, as much. I feel like if anyone here is listening and makan chili, um, please, um, you know, tone down. Okay, so the last question before we move um, to the Q&A um, is sort of um, revolves around 
democracy a bit and our participation in policy making, um, being part of research institutes, being part of governmental governmental agencies, right? So the question um, the question is is that how do we get? So first is is it important for us to participate? And how does it work with regards to its relationship with getting employment in the future? If we voice out enough, would the government or people who are in positions of power in policy making or companies listen to us? And in return, if it does affect the employment rates in the future, how do we get more people to participate, especially from the youth? Maybe we can start from Magat since you're in a government agency. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I think. I think if you actually look at uh, Steve Covey, uh, CIC Three Circle, actually is always about uh, priority. Is always about things within your control. So what's within your control actually for you actually to determine where you are heading, what kind of skills I should have actually for me actually to land my first job. So these are things that within your control. I think some might be over passion about actually voicing out here. What was that things talking about politics and and anything? But if you actually have the platform to express it and it can be heard, then please. But what what I'm trying to say is actually like so based on the Steve Covey three circle, actually focus on what within your control. Usually talking about political, talking about getting all the policy needs to be changed overnight. So it's just beyond totally beyond our control. So what we what are in our control is actually is ourselves where we are heading, where how actually we want actually to craft our future moving forward. So if you actually think of actually like, kalau macam macam I I mentioned earlier, kalau I nak kerja Petronas, I need to know, uh, my 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 employer's appetite, what kind of skill actually I need to actually furnish myself. So these are within your control, then you you can definitely work out for it. We're talking about the big things, the policy change, the uh, political agenda, the political reformation. Like, uh, I'm not actually encourage you to do that because actually, um, and if you actually look at the recruitment space now, the recruiters are now vetting your resume via social media. So and and not to risk yourself about uh politically per se or. Maybe just actually, uh, make social media as a venting space because actually, um, as re- recruiters move into, uh, applicant tracking system, so they have actually things that now assist them in terms of filtering the candidates. So when the moment actually they, I I I saw this, uh, uh um, uh, with my two eyes, there are system that actually can just, you just actually, uh, uh upload document. It can be scanned automatically, so you can you can also scan your social media account. So that's how technology changed, and and that's why I say I say if you are, or if you have a good platform actually to voice out your, um, ideas or anything actually you face like can contribute to the country. Uh, feel free to do it, but if you actually just venting out or just actually like uh, express your frustration. I'm not encouraging you actually to do that online because actually it might affect you uh, in terms of actually try to secure your first employment with the, with the, with the, with the um, technology now. So anything can be just one click away. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Margaret, for that. Thank God I deleted all my social media already. Um, yeah, um, if anyone else is listening, um, you should do the same both for your future employment, but also your sanity. Um, get away from your phone once in a while. Okay, so we're done with the substantive parts of the questions. Um, we'll move on to the Q&A. And we have a lot of questions and um, very good questions coming from the audiences that are watching on Facebook right now. Um, this is one question I want to ask personally before I pass it to Brendan. Because we are a IIUM debate, English debate club, how marketable is debating to potential employers? If does any one of uh, you want to answer? I, I, uh, okay, I, I, can, I can go first. I think um, just now I said, I also mentioned that actually uh, looking at 
what kind of skills can you actually upgrade yourself uh, for employment is essential skills. That includes communication skills, English and everything. So, um, and for you actually to secure jobs, of course, lah, the, the, the simple things like resume, not simple, <laughs> simple for me, but uh, resume. So you need to actually attend interview. Interview actually is a platform for you to perform. Kalau, kalau you actually have the experience debating, I think it's just uh, kacang lah. And for those actually yang memang tak pernah speak English, for those actually yang yang memang tak pernah cakap or or uh, uh, talking um, uh, in a formal manner, so they they might find it problem. They might find it. actually you when when it comes to interview, you need to overcome your nervousness. Nervous satu hal dah tak boleh cakap lagi, then habis tak boleh buat apa. So I think kalau you guys actually have the advantage of actually good. English, good communication skill, definitely actually will be an added advantage for you in securing your first employment. Sebab kita cakap macam you need actually to secure your interview first before you you land a job. Boleh buat kerja ke tak boleh buat kerja tu cerita lain. Kan? You can a bit, you can be a good speaker or you can be a good uh, uh, a narrator, storyteller kan, during your interview but nanti during your job it will de de define whether you are actually a, a performer or not. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so you heard there, uh, you heard it um, first and live. So everyone watching this, join the IOM Debate Club. Um, we do trainings on Mondays and Wednesdays and we send you to debate all over the world. Okay, um, I'll pass you over to, I'll pass the floor over to Brendan. Yeah, hi everyone again. Um, and yeah, we just have some questions from the guests and I'll direct them to the relevant speaker. But of course, feel free either speaker if you have a point and you just want to jump in on the question. So the first question is a very relevant one, I think, for every listener. Is what are what is your take on employers who say things like we prefer candidates with at least three years experience? Um or but then for us as fresh graduates, we are unable to even get experience. So these jobs are out of our reach. So what, what do you think of these companies and what are the solutions to these problems? Maybe, uh, maybe Mr. Megat, you can go first. Okay. Um, I think if you say look at the from employer's point of view, they always want a talent that can straight away do work. Straight away without actually spending so much on training, spending so much on de developing them. They want ready workers. I think that's the reason why actually they put that kind of criteria. But from the talent point of view, when it comes to experience, it's a big word that can be explored. What, what I mean by explore, actually, like, I think some of you actually on your uh, courses, definitely you actually you go for internships. And how heavy you are actually involved in activities. So these are, can be considered that you have actually the experience for, for in terms of actually uh, um, to be qualified on looking just at the uh, soft skills element because actually you need actually to get yourself involved. Um, internship actually go doing internship that benefit you best. Benefit actually the career that you think of venturing after graduation. So, sebab I think the, the the current problem now internship I nak buat internship yang dekat rumah dengan I je lah tapi at the end of the day tak relevant langsung kan I think that's a kind of waste lah in terms of actually like, because by having a good internship you gain experience you gain valuable experience in terms of actually real time experience how actually you you deal with work deal with people build networking that kind of thing um but I think uh, some 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 of our young graduates actually just actually okay lah as long as I dapat uh, internship tak kisah lah kat mana pun kan ada allowance ke tak ada allowance ke tak apa janji I complete my study so I think that that kind that kind of actually uh, thinking is a is a, is is a waste because uh, if you actually look at the uh, we we conduct a, a survey on internship. 26, I think 20, 26 to 28% of our uh, graduate talent actually secure first employment via internship. So it, it means that internship actually play an important role on molding yourself into employment. So if you actually look at German, uh, US, 
um, 50% are actually secured first employment via internship. So we are actually half from them. So uh, make, make, make uh, um, full of uh, internship experience, get internship that benefit you best in terms of your uh, career projection. So get involved with, um, so be active in club, association, NGOs. So these are the elements that can help you building soft skills, building essential skills. Because I say some might not, Kadang-kadang, bila kita cakap macam experience, it can be as, I pernah kerja dekat 7-Eleven. But from recruiter point of view, we are seeing that, oh, you you brave yourself actually to just carry out this kind of work. But in your work, you are actually dealing with people. You build your communication skills. I think these are the the elements that that our young graduates should pay attention to while you are studying, explore. Yes, uh, good grade. Uh, good. Um, uh, you need actually to have a good grade because it's, it's also a requirement for a good job. But don't, uh, don't uh, apa, abaikan yang all these kind of elements that can help you to upgrade yourself, get you actually to be a better communicator, get you actually to be a a um a more strategic thinker for the future. Because actually you get involved with so many things during your studies. Jangan 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 just nanti dalam resume ada experience sebab I buat internship. Internship pula tak relevant dengan my course. Ah, so then 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 you you give hard time for for the recruiter. I think to to also at some point, if you should look at the online job portal, so there definitely there will be a requirement set by the employers. So again, the normal requirement three point two CGPA and above. So you must know that eighty percent of the applicant are actually the memang lah dah memang meet the, the the requirements. So what make you different from others? So all the other things, lah, your internship experience, your exposure. So I uh, masuk debate club, I pernah debate with people in China, for, for example. So I think these are the value added that can be, that, that makes you actually stand uh, different from, from those who actually just do things conventionally. I just do my internship. Internship pun tak relevan sebab I just nak internship dekat depan rumah my mom. Yes, thanks Mr. Vega for that comprehensive perspective and reminding us that internship is not the only like way out <laughs> of the problem. Uh, maybe I can ask this next question to Turaya. This is a question um, to do with um, overcoming the general problem. So the, the questionnaire says that if graduates face low wages that is not proportionate to their degrees. Would everyone asking for a higher wages help mitigate this phenomenon? And I guess it's useful for you, Turaya, to answer because like, you can maybe approach it from how an academic, uh, sorry, a research institution like Kazana would, how would it, how effective do you think this sort of campaign, everyone campaigning for higher wages would work? Yeah, since you have the empirical evidence behind it. Uh, I don't have like specific empirical evidence for it. Um, I can't remember on top of my head, but I think asking for higher wages. Um, hmm. <laughs> Magad, I think you have you have to help me out here because like. I think like what Magad mentioned earlier is like each firms they already have their pay skills. And then you will see that um, in this COVID time, if you go to, um, if you look at uh, Department of Statistics, salary and wages, the one that has increased uh, wage is actually in public <laughs> sector. And um, uh, for the rest of um, the other sectors, they are all struggling, um, you know. So I'm not too sure, but I, what I can say is, okay, I, I hope that this will be useful. If your um, prospective employers um, are not paying minimum wage, if they are not paying your EPF and so, so we have a channel to address that. Um, you can leave and then you can report to the firms. Um, I think Ministry of Human Resources has just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jawatan Buru. Yeah, worker work for something, something yeah. as an apps. And then we just report them. Um, you, th there's no need for drama because depending on your industry, the, it's actually quite so, uh, small circles. Um, and then just move on. Um, 
it doesn't have to be that firm in particular. I mean, like if another firms offer you uh, a better uh, entry levels, then, then go ahead. Um, I feel that for, I'm not sure if this applies to most firms, um, after certain provisions, your, your pay levels yeah. will revise. And it also depends on the, the benefit package. Um, some firms are a bit naughty. Um, the base levels, because they want to pay a lower EPF share and stock free share, but then they make it up for you know allowances. Um, you have that, that discussions. And then maybe perhaps like some firms have a, um, different expectations uh, in terms of workload. They are okay, like you know, 5 p.m. you can clock out. Um, so just be mindful, uh, like the, the pay check that is offered to you comes with territory <laughs> yep. um, and whether or not you're willing to accept it. Um, yep. I think to, to also add to uh, Sraya's point just now, actually like, you also actually, the talent actually need to ask themselves, what are they going to bring on the table? So if they are actually high qualified talent, I as an employer actually, okay lah, tak apa, kalau you have what I need, I'll pay you. Um, uh, um, um, based on your uh, apa, salary expectation and so I think the, the also the, the question is also need to be uh, asked to the talent whether they are up to the game so you you can't just simply ask for high salary tapi you don't have anything with you actually to offer in terms of actually helping or value adding to the organization so yes, like like Sraya pointed out, actually the the territory lies between the industry. They set the benchmark. They set actually on how much actually they want to pay you. And so as long as they are not paying you below minimum salary, they are okay. They are actually not abusing any. Not violating any laws. Yeah, yeah. legally, but, um... they are not abusing. Yeah, and also we have like um, information on nines. I think that certain job portals have published their salary reports and then by industry. I think like job streets in 2019, they published the figures by state, yep, yep, yep. et cetera. So, and then by experience. So you have a gauge on whether your prospective employers are, um, you know, underpaying you. Um, but given the COVID situations and given the figures are, are not very optimistic. Um, but again, like I said, like if they are clearly breaching the laws, then uh, make sure you um, exercise your, your rights. Right, yeah. And then they are mediums lah for you to do that. I think, I think for everyone's information, actually, um, uh, you um, also actually need, need to do your homework, need, need, to, need to know where you are, where is your uh, salary range should stand. So there are uh, a job straight salary report that, that, that release every year. I think we have actually several others um, uh, salary benchmarking. So you can see actually like what are the, what are the salary range should fall. But it doesn't mean that you need actually just to uh, uh, simply bagi tahu employer, kan? Right? So I not, so this report cakap salary, I am saying you should pay this salary lah. So I think yes, the 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 authority is still with the industries, but it's good for you actually to know that so that you can plan better. So so have a look at all this uh, um uh, uh, salary report. So it can it can give you actually at least insights that how you can or how you want actually to 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 map your journey later. Thanks, Megat and Karaya for helping us navigate this very difficult decision of finding of knowing our rights in, in light of us the right salary we should have and i just um that's the final that ends our q and a i would just like to give one minute like about one minute to each speaker um on to allow you to promote the um institution that you're with i'm sure all of us are very curious to know what kri and what talent corp does maybe mr megat uh, you could go first then to raya okay uh, um like I mentioned at the very beginning, actually, um, we are Talent Corp, Talent, Talent Corporation Malaysia Berhad. Uh, we established since 2011. Um, now, we, uh, we are an agency under Ministry of Human Resource. Uh, for those actually looking for internship opportunity, so we are open our doors across the department, across business units. Actually, we are hiring uh, internship because we are also advocating our structured, structured internship program. Uh, for those actually looking for a job, 
there are job available online. We are actually recruiting uh, um, uh, several uh, positions uh, to look into a uh, new business venture, uh, to look into a uh, uh, new uh, intervention uh, program moving forward. Um, we, are, we, we don't really uh, look into what kind of background you are. You can, be, you can be in any background. So we are okay with that. So um, if you actually um, want to explore more, just actually uh, visit our web page, uh, uh, try to look into um, Job Street, My Future Job. Actually, we post our uh, vacancies there. Uh, internship is open all year round. We do uh, physical internship. We do digital internship. Um, yep, that's about it. Thanks, Mr. Mega. And and I think it's very helpful to hear about the availabilities. I think that idea of investigating business ventures is quite an interesting one. It catches my attention. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, Juraya, how about you? Um, yeah, uh, I think I need to clarify, it's like Kazana Research Institute is not Kazana National Bahad. <laughs> we, yeah. we share their office. Um, they are actually our funder, um, through Yasan Hasana. Um, so we started in 2014 and then um, like Tanan Corps, we are open for internships all year long. Um, uh, we are on LinkedIn and also website, but I will encourage you to apply directly and also for any positions that you're interested in. I think I've shared this with um, the member of committees. Um, like, don't stop trying. Um, if you're really interested to do research, um, if they, you don't get any call back for internships, try to apply for permanent permanent position. You never know. Um, we have actually some some members of our, my colleagues that you know didn't get internships but landed permanent positions. And then if you want to work directly under Professor Jomo, then you can contact him directly through his website. Um, yeah, we are a bunch of friendly people. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, it will be a, it will be fun to have you joining us, and given COVID and um now that we have actually you know work mostly online, um I I cannot <laughs> say on behalf of the HR team, but if you need to telework or you know you are in I don't know um in Sarawak or in Belize and you are not able to move to KL, I think that there might be opportunity for you to to work um remotely until at least the COVID um, comes down. That's all. Thanks, Shariah. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I think it's very helpful to the listeners knowing more about Talent Corp and KRI respectively. And with that, um, I'd like to pass it back to Hilmi to, for the closing of this episode. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the panelists, um, Ms. Raya and Mr. Magat. Um, just a quick random question and you can nod if it's a yes and shake if it's a no. Would you allow students who are full-time studying at that moment to also intern? Because for example, like last semester, I did a full-time internship while part-time taking a degree. All right, that's uh, Ms. Raya not had, Mr. Mugat not had. All right, so edu um, your degree and your classes are not a limitation um, to getting an internship. So we, we with have that, one actually. We have one with us. Uh, currently okay. studying full time, but doing uh, internship, like mostly do uh, helping our graduate team. All right. Yeah, we, we also said very quickly. Sorry, Hilmi, We also had like one experience, but I think that I pity her because uh the classes start. She studied in the US, <laughs> so she studied uh, you know at night and then in the morning. Um, <laughs> it's an option, but uh, just so you know that the the. It will be a heavy burden now, but we are actually open to that kind of opportunity. And we are reasonable, reasonable people, you know, we wouldn't push you to, to you know. Okay. Not reasonable. Okay. All right. That's actually amazing to hear. I will send emails to both of you soon. And with that, um, we end this evening's episode on the youth dilemma. Will I ever land a job? On behalf of the co-moderators, me and Brendan, um, we would like to thank all of the speakers for spending their evening here with us at the Great National Discourse. I hope that those tuning in tonight and those who are listening on the recorded version of this episode would benefit from the insight shared by our speakers on the state of the job market, student working transition, and opportunities for us to just have a better life and a better future um, before 
um, everything goes away. We hope that this course has brought light on how to navigate your individual career and pathways as well. Just um, a brief note, we'll try to um, make a summary of all the crucial information from um, upskilling opportunities, those free resources, internship um, opportunities, and so on and so forth um, in our Instagram posts and Facebooks. Um, so as to help some of you who might not have known, um, me, myself um, included, I do not know of these opportunities. And so with that is a wrap. Thanks again from the Great National Discourse team brought to you by the IIUM English Debate Club, which Mr. Murgat said is marketable. So join us in collaboration with Cambridge University Malaysia Society, Oxford University Malaysia Club. Um, and with that, um, goodbye, everyone, and have a good night. Have Thank a good you, everyone. Saturday have a good night. night.